have so many things to be grateful unto the Lord this morning.
Thank you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you to the worship team. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. 2023, hey? I think back, where did the 23 years go since the millennial change? So, well, I welcome you all here this morning on behalf of Apostle Prophet Daniel Nalaya and the leadership and service team here at Reformation Harvest Fire. You're most welcome. All right, um, so we'll just go through some announcements. Um, service times will continue now. Um, scheduled Sunday worship, 10 o'clock every Sunday here. Prayer meeting Wednesdays at 7 o'clock on a conference call for an hour. And the prayer meeting meeting here at 7 o'clock at church for praying for Australia and the nations. So that's for an hour as well. So they will continue now. Uh, prayer meetings start back as normal, yes? Yep, that's right. Prayer meeting on Saturday at 3 o'clock. We'll be on a conference call specifically praying for Israel. So there's great opportunities for you to join in with the rest of the team. So we'd love to have you. Rescue Sri Lanka and Mission for the Philippines are continuing to uh, gather donations and their continuing needs in both of those nations, particularly now post-COVID and uh, even after Christmas, needs will continue. So please um, see any member of the leadership team um, in, with what is needed at the moment and what you have to donate. All right. So Australia Day is approaching. We're only a couple of weeks away from Australia Day. So if you'd please put that in your diary and there's a whole weekend worth of um, meetings, opportunity to see Pastor Donnie Swaggart and Pastor Daniel, Nal Re Apostle Prophet Daniel Nalaya talk on, those, on that weekend. And um, so please come join in. There is a schedule so if you'd like to know when the times are on so please refer to that and that has all the dates anyway of everything that we've got going on so wonderful a bit more of a sad announcement but um pastor gordon many of you know that his wife had passed away suddenly and uh, almost unexpectedly um and she had kidney failure i don't know the underlying issue but um pastor gordon i think many of you already know that but it happened a few weeks ago um, but the funeral service will be held Friday. And what time, Yvonne, was that? I think it's in the morning. 2 p.m., sorry, 2 p.m. Uh, if you'd like to know the location. Um, Sirius Chapel. Which suburb is it? If anyone wants to go and support... Pastor Yvonne, you can speak to Pastor Yvonne after, so um, to get around and um, support Pastor Gordon during that this difficult time. So, all right. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Pastor Yvonne. I mean, introduce. <laughs> you already know who who Pastor Yvonne is, but we have the absolute honour of hearing Pastor Yvonne Gentle preach today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's awesome that you've already actually heard my message in the songs, the worship songs today. I did pick a couple of them, but I didn't pick them all, so that was absolutely awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'd just like to, first of all, just start with... Let's just thank the Lord. Just let's praise him. Let's give him the honour. Lord, we just give you praise and honour. We, we acknowledge, Lord, how awesome you are. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are our God, our our mighty God. And Lord, we just offer ourselves to you. We love you. And uh, we just want to honour you today. We want to acknowledge how awesome you are, how holy you are, and how, Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us, and you're always here with us. And Lord, that you consider us the apple of your eye. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. How an awesome God we serve, and we do. He's awesome. Uh, I've entitled this message, Jesus Teaching on Prayer, but it's actually uh, quite a bit more than that, but that's how it started out. So, so I want to look at Matthew chapter 4, 5 and 6. And I'm sorry I didn't give any extra um, scriptures to the sound desk, but I hope that they maybe can catch on on a couple. <laughs> so first of all, 
I would like to look at the setting for this very important but somewhat glanced over teaching of our Lord Yeshua. And I just want to say that I prefer to use Yeshua or Jesus. It's a personal preference. And it's just between me and the Lord. But I know that everybody knows who I'm talking about when I say Yeshua. Thank you. Well, previous to his teaching on prayer, namely the Lord's Prayer, as it is known, which we are going to look at today, we should really check at what Yeshua has been up to before he spoke on this subject. Where was he? What was he doing? And who was he with? Well, we read in Matthew chapter 4 that one thing he was doing was getting together his team. He was choosing his disciples. In Matthew 4.23, we read that Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Among the people, he was demonstrating and revealing that he was indeed the Messiah. Hallelujah. In verse 24, so the news about him, this is Matthew 4, 24, and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. So the news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were sick, those suffering with various diseases and pains, those under the power of demons, the epileptics, the paralytics, and he healed them. I'm mostly using the Amplified Bible today um, because it, it does give extra meaning. However, I do cut out some of the additional meaning, which is in the brackets, because that's not the scripture, uh, because it can get a bit wordy and sometimes confusing to people who are listening. So let's go carry on. So you can imagine... He became pretty famous and sought after. If you were getting healed of your sicknesses, etc., the word would sh surely soon spread. So, so his disciples were there to witness all this. And so it must have been overwhelming for them. In Matthew 4.25, large crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and the other side of Jordan. And Matthew 5, 1 says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then in verse 1, or verse 2, it reads, Then he began to teach them. That's the disciples that he was teaching. Saying, he's saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Right, I'm going to, this is what we call... Um, the Beatitudes, but I'm going to backtrack here for a minute. <coughs> In the original Greek language scriptures, or it's, the, it's called the original language scriptures, which are Greek, which I refer to frequently for clarity, the large crowds mentioned in verse 25 of chapter 4 are described in the Greek language as riffraff. And even riotous, because I guess they were all clamoring, clamoring for a healing or, or such. So it seems that Yeshua was going up into the mountain to get away from the crowd and to spend time with his disciples, whom at that time he had just recently required, acquired. The King James Version of the Bible says that he went into the mountain to sit down and teach them, his disciples. The Greek implies that the disciples came near to him to worship him and to learn from him. But this is not what most biblical commentators would teach. They would have us believe by drawing us the picture of Yeshua on a mountain ledge with thousands or at least hundreds of people below, tentatively listening, suggesting the Sermon on the Mount or the part that is known as the Beatitudes, was to thousands of people. However, the contents of these chapters points to a more intimate picture by telling us in 5.2, it tells us in the word, 
he was with the disciples that, and he was teaching them. Now, the Greek scripture I'm referring to is part of the Spectrum Bible, which is, has a, quite a few Bibles as part of it, um, different um, like the King James, the KJV, etc., etc. So, um, and the New English Translation, the Amplified. So it has quite a few Bibles and one of them is the original Greek. And the original Greek uh, Bible is a bit like a lexicon or an interlinear. You get up the verse you want, you tap on the word, and up will come the various meanings in English that that word can mean or that word does mean. So that's, that's what I use. Uh, so once up the mountain, <coughs> the disciples drew near to him which the Greek suggests was to worship him. And then he opens his mouth to teach them. Awesome, wasn't it? Sitting there with the Lord, him teaching us. <laughs> so we see in chapter 5 that whatever Yeshua had to say was important. His teaching was basic but penetrating. He didn't give out poetic sermons just to sound good. He was putting forth a message grounded in the promises of God first. If his disciples were going to be faithful followers in his ministry, they would need to be grounded in his word and in his principles. Matthew chapter 5, 3 onwards, Yeshua starts his teaching. He says in verse 3, blessed and the Amplified Bible brings out the different meanings of blessed, as you'll see as I go through some of these. Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit, which are those devoid of spiritual arrogance, those who regard themselves as insignificant. That's in brackets. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom belongs to them both now and forever. Matthew 5, 4, in the Amplified Bible, it says, blessed or forgiven are those, and there's other meanings as well, but forgiven, are those who mourn over their sins and repent, for they will be comforted when the burden of sin is lifted. The Greek implies that this also is the meaning. And verse 5 Matthew 5, 5, blessed, inwardly peaceful and secure are the gentle, the kind-hearted and the self-controlled, for they will inherit the earth. 5, 6, blessed, joyful, is one of the meanings of blessed here, are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, those who actively seek right standing with God, in brackets, for they will be completely satisfied. And Matthew 5, 7, blessed, content with God's promises, is the meaning that's given here. Are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And 5, 8, which is where I'll finish on the Beatitudes, <laughs> Blessed, spiritually mature, are the pure in heart, that's of, God's, of godly character, for they shall see God. Wow. These are character-building teachings which I felt we needed to look at as they are connected to Yeshua's teaching on prayer and are related to to our heart condition. This is very important. I will leave the Beatitudes here and move on to Yeshua's teaching on prayer, which is Matthew chapter 6, which is also part of his Sermon on the Mount. Yeshua had not moved from the mountain and his disciples were still seated with him. The Lord began by teaching first what is most important and foundational to all relationships and especially our relationship to God through prayer. 
we're, when we're praying, we're communicating with God. This is the privilege of prayer. Which is, it's a believer's primary function in their relationship with him. It's also a privilege and tremendous blessing that we can communicate with God. So we need to approach prayer in the right way. And this is what Yeshua is teaching his disciples in chapter 6. Before he taught them on prayer, he also spoke to them about their relationship with him. He spoke to them about lots of things. but Their relationship with him, I'll just give a brief overview. And how they should reflect this to others. He spoke on God's laws, some of the commandments, marriage, the treatment of wives, giving to the poor, offerings to the Lord and other quite um, deep teachings. It is obvious from the content he was not teaching a crowd that was hanging around to receive a personal healing or whatever else they could get. Yeshua's teaching in Matthew 5 and 6 are foundational to discipleship. In chapter 6, we see that Yeshua tells his disciples that when they do good deeds, like giving to the poor, etc., don't be seen by men or seek the praise of man, for that would be the only reward that they would receive. These actions would liken them to hypocrites and they would be considered, in God's view, no better than the Pharisees. Wow. Wow. That must have been a, a hard word to swallow. This is a challenging teaching because it pulls us up on our motives, what we do and why we do things. It teaches us to search our hearts to make sure that they are pure and transparent so that we will not sin. When we search our own hearts, we come to understand that we can deceive ourselves, be led into sin through the seemingly good things that we do. This is because our motives, if only in part, can be self-centred. This heart check is especially relevant before we approach God in prayer. This is why I believe that Yeshua brought this to his disciples' attention before he spoke to them on the subject of prayer. Our hearts need to be pure and transparent before we come to God to seek his face, to offer praise, to communicate in any prayerful manner. So how do we do this? If we find that we have selfish motives or our hearts are not right, we need to repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness, which the Lord promises to give to those who repent. You can look up 1 John 1 9 for that. Yeshua teaches this to his disciples before he teaches on prayer. So our prayers will not be hindered. And we will get results from our prayers. Psalm 66, 18 reads, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. I believe the Lord never does anything randomly or without order. This is why he is teaching about heart condition before prayer. He is teaching us to have our hearts and motives right before we come into his presence. So that when we pray, our prayers can be effective. It is imperative that when we come before the Lord in prayer, that we have our hearts right. That is a clean heart. Remember, it was King David whom the Lord said, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, and also repeated by Paul in Acts 13, 22, was a man, King David, was a man after God's own heart. 
And why did God say this of King David? Maybe it was because David's prayer to him in Psalm 51, 10 to 12 was create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. <laughs> it's an awesome scripture. Here are a few other verses that emphasise this. Proverbs 4, 23. It says, it's, this is a new literal transla translation. It says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Matthew 5, 8, which we have read, says, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. And James 8, sorry, James 4, verse 8, says, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Purify your heart, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So we need to purify our hearts so our loyalty will not be divided. So we see that having a clean heart is what is required for having a good relationship with the Lord. And obviously relationship is through prayer, it's through our prayer life. How should we pray then? There are many facets of prayer. There are personal, earnest prayers when we pour out our heart and on personal matters where we seek solace with the Lord. That's Matthew 6, 6 to 8. This should be done in private. However, there is also corporate prayer. Isaiah 56, 7 says, His house shall be a house of prayer. In Acts 12, 12 to 17, Peter is set free from prison because of corporate prayer. Wow, there's power in corporate prayer. There are many examples in scripture of this kind of prayer. And there's national prayer, where the heads of nation pray for their people and their land. Psalms 2, 10 to 11 tells us, rulers of the earth need to serve the Lord. They need to be instructed by him. They need to hear from him to have reverence for him so they can rule justly. Doesn't, I just added that bit. <laughs> but Proverbs 29, 23, uh, 2 to 3 verifies that. It says, the people rejoice when the righteous rule. They can only rule righteously through a prayer relationship with the Lord. Agree? Yes. Jesus' teaching on prayer covers all our prayer situations. In Matthew 6, 9 to 15 is possibly Yeshua's first teaching on prayer. Known to us as the Lord's Prayer, which only the Lord's Prayer only covers uh, 9 to 13. However, this is not the Lord praying, but the Lord teaching us the manner in which we should pray. When I said the Lord's Prayer only covers 9 to 13, that's what we think the Lord's Prayer only covers, because that's where everybody finishes it. Okay, so so um, we should, I'll just read that again. This is not the Lord praying, but the Lord teaching us the manner in which we should pray. This is once we have prepared our hearts. There are six main points to his teaching. So number one, the first is to acknowledge his greatness in Matthew 6, 9. Yeshua instructs, pray then in this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. We're to honour God before we start praying. This first, the first thing we do, we should do when we come into the Lord's presence, 
is acknowledge how great he is and how holy he is. We come with reverence, knowing what an awesome God we have the privilege of communicating with. We start our prayer with praise and worship and glorifying him for who he is. We need to focus on who he is when we're praying to him. Also, understanding he is in heaven and although we are on earth, he hears us. That's a, a mystery, isn't it? But he tells us he hears us. So, point two, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for his kingdom or kingdom principles as what is already in heaven to be active on earth. This is what this means. This could be in our lives, our families, our communities, governments, and so on. Praying for the Lord's kingdom principles to be operating on earth will naturally be praying for him, for his will in all situations. His perfect will already operates in heaven. The lower level of heaven that they tell me is like earth, a bit like earth, only perfect. No sickness, no poverty, no decay, lies, deception, no doubt, no insecurities or ugliness of any kind. Hallelujah. There's no ugliness of any kind in heaven. Awesome. We can pray for these things to be done away with in our lives. Because, why? Because God says to pray for that. That's what he says to pray for. And in that manner, we should be able to go into the throne room and put it before the Lord saying, this is not present in your heavenly kingdom, so therefore I'm asking you to remove it from my life. This is coming boldly before the throne of grace which is what Paul commends us to do. This, he said, is how we would receive mercy. That is Hebrews 4.16. Give us this day our daily bread, point three. This is asking the Lord to supply what we need to live our lives. This is not giving us what we think we need or necessarily what we want. Although, if our heart motives is right, he does say he will give us the desires of our heart. That's in Psalm 37, 4. But we should read also uh, 3 and 5. If we delight in him, fully trusting in him, he will give us the desires of our heart. Our desires should be his desires that he has deposited in our hearts. Yeshua will give us what we need to complete the calling he has put on our lives. The devil may try to tell you otherwise, but we have it on good authority from the Lord himself that he will supply our needs. So we need to take God up on that. God will also give us what we need to do certain situations to do in certain situations that come up in our lives or the lives of others that are entrusted to us. James 4, 2 to 3 tells us, we have not because we ask amiss or with the wrong motive. So if we sin, we are asking amiss. If we're in sin, when we're praying, we're asking amiss. If we ask not believing God is going to supply that need, that is also asking amiss because we are asking and not trusting him with our request. Also, as stated, we need to ask with a clean heart. So we know how to get a clean heart. If we know that we're sinning or 
there's something in our lives, we go before the Lord, repent and ask for his forgiveness. So Matthew 6, 12.4 says, And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, letting go of the wrong and resentment that we have. Amplified version. Here we are told <coughs> we not only can, but we need to ask the Lord for forgiveness for all the sins we have accumulated against him, against others, and even against ourselves. Sin is appropriately described here as debt. I like that because that is how we feel about someone who has done us wrong. We feel that they owe us. It could be something big or it could only be small, but it can hinder us. So here Yeshua teaches that we can ask to be forgiven for our sins in the same manner we have forgiven others. Mm. In other words, if we forgive others by letting go allowing all the hurt and the pain that we feel from what they have done to us or those that we care about, just let it dissolve away, the Lord will do the same for us. When we repent and ask for his forgiveness, he will drop the charges, the debt or the sin that we could never pay for. He's already paid for that. But we have to have the right heart. We have to come to him. We have to clean our heart. That means all our debts and sins will be dissolved. So point five. In Matthew 6.13, the word says in the New English translation, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. However, the Greek meaning is best reflected in the God's Word translation, which says, don't allow us to be tempted. Instead, rescue us from the evil one. So it has, it's a different meaning, isn't it? You see, what Yeshua is saying is that we should pray that God will not allow the evil one to tempt us. And we should ask God to rescue us from him and his plans for evil against us. God does not tempt us. Remember Job? He may allow us to be tempted. But in this verse, we are encouraged to pray against temptation. So if he was tempting us, he wouldn't encourage us to pray against temptation. And we're encouraged to pray against temptation and ask the Lord to protect us from the temptations of the devil. In most translations today, the additional words, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever, amen, they're not included in the text. All the, te all the translations that I looked at, apart from the King James Version, did not have that in the text. They were added into the text, so they were not in the original scriptures, though, those words. They were added into the text of the King James Version, and this is how we all have thought that the Lord's Prayer concludes at the end of verse 13, and we think that it concludes with those words. This is not the case. Point six. I just want to make this point six. This is not the case. Yeshua's teaching on prayer continues for another two verses. And I believe this is a pivotal point of his teaching. The last two verses are related to how the evil one can distract us and get us to look at others and what they are doing, how they have wronged us, 
and how justified we are in holding on to that wrong that they have committed against us. This is what I believe Yeshua was saying when he said to pray to God against this temptation. Which is what, what it is. It's a temptation. This temptation is to hold on to wrong that others have done to us. This temptation is of the evil one. He comes to us saying how we have been wronged, how bad others are, and how we are justified in not forgiving them. This speaks to our flesh nature. And it's a huge self-righteous temptation because we do feel justified. But Yeshua is telling us in verse 14 and 15 that we, if we do not forgive others their sins, we won't be forgiven for our sins or our wrongs that we commit against others. And we do. There are none righteous without Yeshua, no, not one. That meets God's approval. Romans 3, 10 in the Amplified Version. So Matthew 6, 14 says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and will willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Wow, hallelujah. But if you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurts and your anger, then your Father will not forgive you, your trespasses. Amplified version. And by the way, it's in the other, this, this is also in the other, uh, the full meaning is in the other um, text as well. So this means if we can't forgive, we won't be forgiven. Therefore, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Our being able to forgive is required for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is so important for us to know and understand. This is why we need to be on the alert always to pr and pray the Lord to protect us from this temptation, the temptation not to forgive, that is. And so ends this segment of the Lord's prayer, of, of teaching on the Lord's prayer or teaching on prayer. The teachings on the mount continued all through chapter 7, where Jesus appears to move from teaching his disciples to also speaking to the throng as it's described, or the crowd. However, in chapter 7, the message changes tone and is more general than what it has been in the previous chapters, and it seems to fit a crowd scene better. Before I close, I would like to address the additional sentence in chapter um, 6, verse 13, which says... For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. The translators of the 1611 King James Bible assumed that a Greek manuscript they possessed was ancient and therefore adopted the phrase, they adopted the phrase, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Into the Lord's Prayer, or what they considered was the Lord's Prayer, of Matthew gospel. I have a link for that if you're interested for more information. However, what this line has done is to distract from the essential teaching of verse 14 and 15, which tells us if we allow the devil to tempt us into not forgiving, we also will not be forgiven. We are to come against this temptation and pray that God will not allow us to be tempted in this manner. Verse 13. So then, in summarising, what am I saying? Firstly, I'm saying we need to prepare our hearts. 
before we communicate with God. To keep them clean and to keep us from sinning. So we can constantly be in a state of prayer and fellowship with, with the Lord. Secondly, we should follow the instructions the Lord Yeshua has set out for our prayer life in Matthew chapter 6, 9 to 15. No, no, no don't finish at 13, 9 to 15. So let us, let us pray. I'm finishing early, aren't I? <laughs> oh, Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just commit this word to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that it is your word. And Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that it's been able to minister to people here today. That we've all learned something. I know just doing this, this, this um, word this morning that I learned things. No matter how often we read the scriptures, we can always learn from your word, Lord. So, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that we live in a country like Australia where at the moment anyway, we're free to read your word, we're free to come together, we're free to praise you, we're free to be here and acknowledge you and acknowledge how great you are. Hallelujah. I just give you all the praise and worship, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for you first loved us. We didn't first love you. You first loved us and drew us to yourself. And you drew us to yourself, not just to be anybody, but to be sons and daughters of the living God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I commit this word to you today. In Yeshua's name, amen. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Lord.